Uh, good afternoon. Oh, it's go this is going to be hard work, isn't it? <laughs> more coffee, more chocolate. Come on, come on, come on, come on. So, look, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. That's what we want. So, Tony Fish. The, the great thing about having a name like Tony Fish is, one, it's short and everybody around the world can spell it. But the, thing, the second thing is, when you go to Google and you search for Tony Fish, the first thing you discover is there is an awful lot of Italians called uh, Tony Fish because they have fish restaurants. <laughs> the second thing you discover about Tony Fish is a lot of guys called Tony go fishing and they have those nice pictures of a big catch and a big smile. I think, so that's why they get to Tony Fish. Then you get people like me called Tony Fish uh, and there's uh, 400 plus of us around the world who have got our name and uh, I wish my name was John Smith because it would be much easier to hide. Uh, the, uh, the last one unfortunately there's a guy in Japan who's a porn artist um, who's <laughs> taken... It's a bit unfortunate, so when you do search, you do have to be a bit careful. Anyway, look, here we, here we are. Um, I've got a few slides at the beginning, really to set some context, and we're going to wander through a, a few of them. So they seem a bit random, but they make a little more sense as we go through. The first one is, is a balancing act I've got to draw between you're here as a series of professionals because you work within an environment trying to recruit. Okay, and there's a multitude of different disciplines here, both from the advertising side and the marketing side and the technology side and the actual placement and recruiting and the assessment. The other side, though, you are one of these seven billion people, which could have happened this week or six months ago. Okay, but you're a person, and you actually are going to go looking for another job at some point in time, and you actually have a profile, and you've got this balance of, actually, I don't want to engage, but I need everybody who's out there to engage to tell me about themselves. So we've got these conflicts going on between what you want as a professional and actually what you might want as a person. And the other side of it is we actually have these things called personas, which is kind of like what you are, but kind of like not what you may actually be. A bit like having a friend who's got that problem. Pencil, a bit of a random thing. There is nobody on the earth, I would contend, who knows how to make a pencil. There's nobody who knows how to fell the tree, to cut it up, to make, put the wood together to then go and mine the graphite and refine the graphite, who then knows how to get the yellow and paint it and put the colouring on, who knows how to go and mine the tin and refine the tin, who knows how to go to the tree to create the rubber, to put the chemicals together, to actually mould it and put the pink in, and then create the whole thing and put it all together, let alone then sell it and put it into distribution and price it. So there's not one person on the planet who can do a pencil. So don't believe anything I say because there cannot be a single expert in one thing. We don't know how to build a mobile phone. Steve Jobs, rest in peace, he did not know how a mobile phone worked. He could not build a mobile phone. He could not refine the silicon. He could not do all the coding. People don't know everything. What I've been asked to do is come along and do this sort of matrix. And the sort of matrix that comes along it says stuff has to be big and stuff money cannot buy, and that's called disruption, and we're going to talk about some disruption things that come along, picking up on some of Tommy's themes. Uh, the other bits you know, stuff that's big, costs uh, lots of money is strategy, uh, we know this one as well, it's not big, but it still costs lots of money is consulting, and trivia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my wife saw me doing these slides, so she wanted to add these things, and, uh, and my daughter's got hold of the slides, and then I think they were indicating what they wanted for Christmas. <laughs> You've seen this slide probably an awful lot and a number of times through lots of different management courses. Okay, this is my world. Okay, in my world, I talk about digital and mobile. I invest, I build businesses, and I sell businesses, and that's what I do. Everything I do is in digital. Okay, so the rest of the world actually is insignificant to me because that's all I do. So when I'm presenting this, I'm presenting a viewpoint of my world. Okay, your world is about recruiting. Okay, your world then has contentions of family of contentions of TV, of earning salary, of money, and lots of other things. So when we talk about what I'm going to do, actually, you think this little black blob is a lot smaller than I do. But you know the slide. The black blobs are the same size. It's all about perspective. This is, to me, probably the most interesting slide I will present, because it tells me an awful lot about you lot. Okay? Now, who watch Outnumbered? Anybody watch Outnumbered? Karen, isn't she the sweetest little thing ever? Okay, Karen has this thing about pink brains in one of the episodes, and she goes and talks about people with young, dynamic pink brains. They're malleable, they're engaging, they cre create everything, they'll absorb anything. And when a slide like Stand Up comes along, what would they do? 
Let's stand up. Versus the old, grey, dull, shriveled brains who are so locked in to their own perspective they won't look at it. I'm not making a judgement about you guys, but just want to talk about it. Tommy's written a lot of books. I've written a book. They're in your goodie pack. Uh, you'll go away and you can read them and you come and ask us questions. OK, we're not writing books on our own about what's happening. Here is another ten books, OK, which are fantastic, which have all been published in the last few years, which absolutely add weight to what we're talking about. You can't read them all. You need people to read them for you. So get together into groups of ten, buy one each and then share them. Be far quicker. Or you just go onto the websites and look at the summary, whichever one takes fast. We're not making this up. There's other people around the world doing lots of research. I'll read this one for you. Whilst I don't know exactly what you're thinking, I know what generic behaviour looks like, what you've done, and therefore what you will do. I probably know more about you, what you're thinking, what you'll do, and how you react, than you're willing to accept. Now, when Eric Schmidt stood on stage 18 months ago, a year ago, and said this, and we said, before you actually type on Google search bar, I know what you're going to type, the world went, oh, help, privacy, get the guy out of here, heretic. When I stand here and say, I know more about you than you're willing to accept, you get really, really scared. Or you think, actually, this is going to be really fun and really exciting. But the reality is, I know more about you than you're willing to accept. And because it's the list stuff, the internet and some beliefs. If you talk to any engineer who explains the internet to you, this is what they'll talk about. The, the map, the nodes and how the interconnection works. This is my simple view of the world. Okay, the internet needs you. What you do is you consume data. You go to YouTube and you watch a video. You go to a shop and you do something. Okay, that's the consumption side of the internet, where you're clicking to find things or searching. You create content, you create a blog, you create a tweet, you create a recommendation, you create a Facebook profile, you upload a picture, you do something, but you're creating content. And what the internet does down the bottom here is it stores all of that. So what you're doing, okay, is creating and consuming content and it's being stored. What the web does, what the internet's doing, okay, is creating intelligence from everything that you do. And what we're going to talk about is how that intelligence comes about and actually where the value, value lies. So the internet is not about a web. It is not about a network. It's about you. And without you, the internet is nothing. And it comes back to these ideologies and what, what Tom has done and stressed in the mobile piece is so critically important. Because we generated the whole mobile world and we sold licenses and we built mobile on the back of you being a consumer. Okay, you've now turned to be the product. Okay, in Facebook, are you the consumer of Facebook? No, you're not. You give data to Facebook. Who is Facebook's customer? It is the advertising agencies. Therefore, are you the product or are you the consumer? Are you the customer? Okay, you are the product. And because what's happening in the mobile world is I'm trying to get all of this data off your mobile device. I know who you are, what content you're doing, I know where you are, I know what time it is, I know what the intent is you're about to do, and I know what direction you're going. I have a little Bluetooth device in my bag, which has been picking up all of your Bluetooth signals if they're turned on. What I'm doing is assimilating them to your LinkedIn profile, and you'll get a LinkedIn invite from me, because you're now my friends, because you're in the room. Scared? <laughs> Why? Are you going to engage in this public world, or are you going to run away? There's some really nice islands. They're quite a long way away, and they haven't got internet access, apparently. But that's where you'll have to go to escape. It's not about getting data to your screen. You are no longer the consumer. You are the product. And what we're trying to do is create this symbiotic relationship. And the symbiotic relationship is you create content, you consume content. And in the process of doing that, backwards and forwards to web services, okay, companies are trying to get hold of your data and analyse it. And there's this trade of data. And what they're trying to do is get hold of that data and analyse it. Because the analysis of your data is where all of the values lies. And if I write great algorithms which analyses your data better than somebody else, I have differentiation. Why is Google not worried about certain patents, but massively worried about analytical patents? What we're trying to do is get hold of these things. Signals, spikes, pulses, waves and trends. 
because out of your data, I'm going to learn something. And it's not just out of your data, as we'll see in a couple of minutes. It's about your whole network. It's about everybody you associate with. I'm after the signals that come that you're an intending to do something. There's an intention economy. I intend to buy something because I put it into a store. I see somebody else has bought something, so I might intend to buy it. I'm looking for those spikes about something about to happen. I'm looking for pulses as they come along. I'm looking for trends and waves. And we're looking for these types of data. Because business, we were taught that management school was about a value chain. You start with a component, you add them all the way through subsystems, you end up with a product or a service and you flog it. That's gone. In the digital world, okay, you are at one end of it providing data to the business. You are providing those click researches into Google. You're on the other end of Google then saying what happens. So you're at the front end providing the data. You're at the back end receiving the results of that data. What Google does is then they shut the loop. They close the feedback loop. Same with Facebook. I can see what you've reacted to. Why is mobile so important? It's part of closing the feedback loop. And if you can't close the feedback loop, you're nagged. That's a technical term. <laughs> but I've got this other side, indirect feedback. I'm not only interested in what you do, what you touch. I'm interested in what your friends touch from what you've done. We were having a little Twitter debate down here. Somebody's going to retweet something. That's really great because that tells me that you're interested in it. But it also tells me who you're connected to. Not only does it tell me who you're connected to, your friends who retweet it, we go into a social network. So I can pick up your reputation, your authority, because of what your friends have done, not because of what you've done. So you might do nothing, but you end up with a reputation. So it's not about you, it's about us. We are citizens of a digital world. Therefore, we have rights and responsibilities. So I want to talk about some data, and I've got some questions for you. Uh, how is all data? All data is every piece of data you can possibly imagine in the world that exists somewhere. And your data, OK? You can call it my data, your data, somebody's data, unique pieces of data associated to you. So how is all data and my data related? And do you believe that everybody in the room has the same model as you? If we had a workshop, bless you. If we had a workshop, bless you again. I'm glad it's after Halloween. The, uh, we'd put lots of things on the wall and we'd go and draw some Venn diagrams and after a couple of hours we'd come out with this. And what this says is there's a righteous model, which is you believe that your data is just a tiny subset of all data, which is what a lot of people believe straight away. When they think about it, actually my data could be all data because I want total transparency. Why should somebody hide something? So actually all data is all together and everybody has access to everything. There's an idealistic model where some of your data could exist outside of all data. How? Doesn't matter, but people believe it. Actually, I might have multiple personas. So I could have lots of different data groups which are separated or isolated. I might want to try and have all of my data outside of all data. I want to be completely private. Or I might want to try and replicate my data. So the thing about it is we haven't got one model. And the purpose of doing this is when you think about Tony Fish, you might look at him and go, you're right, Lara. Yeah. Sure, we're just on slightly different sides. I mean, we're looking on the... Oh. There we go. Oh. <laughs> hey. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, OK. <laughs> The reason for the spooky, yeah. <laughs> the, um, the purpose of saying this is, is when you hear about what I'm saying, you can say Tony Fish is barking mad because I disagree. Tony Fish, actually, he's talking a lot of sense. Actually, I'm not really sure if he's somewhere in the middle. And the purpose is because we all come at data from different directions. Your CIO, your CTO, your CEO will all have different models. Why will the board argue incessantly about data? Because they haven't got the same model. And I spend an awful lot of time working with these guys, trying to work out data. Next set of questions. How is my data, this is just data about you, and your identity related? Do you reckon we've all got the same model? Again, we'd do the Venn diagrams and spend some time. we would come to this. We kind of like think there is a relationship between my identity and my data. 
but they cross over. We kind of like my, actually feel my identity is completely defined by my data. Some of you may believe that actually your identity is just a subset of all data. Some of you will believe you have multiple identities in your data. One or two of you will want to be a human and you'll feel that your identity is bigger than your data. But we have a series of different models. I don't know which ones are right. And actually it doesn't matter because it's based on our upbringing. It's based on our experiences. It's based on our views, our preferences, what our parents have taught us, what our kids are doing. We don't really know. So let's not argue about what data is or isn't. Let's understand we've got different models. How is my data and my rights related? Is there a relationship? And have we got the same model? Here we go again. There's four models. So my data and rights. Actually, I might only have certain rights over a little bit of my data. I should have rights over all of my data. I should have some rights over some of my data. Or actually, I have no rights over any of my data. And when you take these three bundles about all data, my data, identity, and rights, and you see the complexity of different models, and when you sit there having a debate with me afterwards, can you define which one you're having before you start arguing with me? Because I know which model I'm in, and if you're not in the same model as me, it ain't going to go very well. <laughs> And the problem we come to is then the board stands up and says, oh, we want to do a mobile strategy. We want to do this. We want to do this with data. We want to do this with data. And then they come up and say, are we there yet? Has it finished? Have we got the ROI? And I'm afraid you have to go, no, because we haven't got the same series of models. And so talking about boards and data and where it's going and how we're going to analyze data and create value from it is not as simple as, as Tommy knows elegantly put, as putting as an iPhone app up. There is a lot more to it. The reason for writing my digital footprint, as uh, Felix introduced at the beginning, I'm an investor, so I've built up a number of businesses and sold them. The problem as an investor, if you don't know the market structure where you're going, you don't know where to invest. So what I did was I wrote a book to help me invest. So this is basically my investment philosophy. And I created this work called Digital Footprint for myself, thinking it, nobody could possibly misunderstand Digital Footprint. Oh, I'm so delusioned. <laughs> The education industry in America has a very particular view of what a digital footprint is, and it ain't the same as mine. A number of people come along and they look at digital footprint and say it's only about the data you leave. Some people come along a digital footprint and they say actually because you've got a laptop and it has this square area and it's digital, that's a digital footprint. Some people look at it as a company and say because I've got a digital presence somewhere, we have a digital footprint. And then you get the Guy Kawasaki view of the world as the holy cow, which describes where you actually go. And it says, what is a digital footprint? A digital footprint is this. We know it's what you say about yourself. That's the easy bit. OK, digital footprint is also what the analysis of data says about you. Now, a 15-year-old comes along, takes an algorithm, cuts the code. And unfortunately, a 15-year-old has a series of biases about the way they're going to code that algorithm. My interpretation of what you're doing is based on a 15-year-old's interpretation of an algorithm. Or it could be a 35-year-old, or it could be a 55-year-old. You don't have any control over that person writing code or doing that analysis. And actually, if we've got three people to do it, every time it will be different. So I need to know what the analysis says. Then I want to know is when I've embedded some data into what you've already told me, how you react to it. So when I feed back information I've learned about you, did I get it right or did I get it wrong? And therefore I can start to refine it. So that's one side of it. Then it's about this whole social group. You've got a pile of friends. What do they say about your data? What are they saying about you? Our poor mate John in the early from Felix. Somebody else said something. Where does he have control? He didn't. How did his analysis, the same algorithm, bias somebody's view over and above yours? Why did somebody else have a higher authority than you on a particular subject? Then when I've embedded all of that data, and it's called metadata, I can start to understand what people are saying about yourself. So it's about what you say plus what others are saying. And obviously I'm talking to you as people now, not as professionals. This is what's happening to your data. But you want to get all of this data on everybody because it makes recruitment really easy. But if you're not willing to provide this data yourself, why do you expect somebody else to? There's a bunch of conflicts that come through. 
And that person who's turning up in front of you, have they got the same model of data and identity that you have? Interesting questions. So you get to this thing and say, I want to control it, because we come from a world where we were taught control, 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 control. We must control. The kids are coming through and saying, off you go. Tough luck, you have no control. You do not control the screen experience because you don't control the mobile network. The question earlier from, uh, about mobile networks. And what happens? You don't control the mobile network. You don't control the HTC. You don't control the algorithm. So you don't control anything at that end. You don't control the purchase behavior of the way the person is going to interact with the data that's presented, nor the payment experience. Now, you go into a shop and you want to buy something. Okay, you at this point are giving your credit card over and you think, actually, I'm buying something. That credit card starts a transaction. Who owns that data? You don't. The retail shop doesn't. Does the credit card company? Do you have any rights to any of that data? Why do you believe you have rights to that data? If I can sell that data, so what? But you want to control this because of the model that you did earlier. So where's it all going? Who creates identity? Lots of lots of people would love to turn around and tell you they create identity for you. So, Tony Fish. You probably believe my name's Tony Fish. It's a complete and utter lie. It's not. It's not on my birth certificate. It's not on my bank account. OK, I've got a blog page, and I've got a book, and I've got a Twitter account, and they all say Tony Fish. So you believe I'm Tony Fish. And it meets the real name's policy of Google+, Plus, so I'm allowed to be Tony Fish. But I'm not. Doesn't exist. Tony Fish does not exist. Phantom, made up. It's lovely. Short and easy to spell. The issue is identity doesn't create value. Knowing your name has absolutely nothing to do with your skills, what you're going to do, where you're going to go, how you're going to behave. This unfortunately says, and this is my Tesco's card, and it says, Mr. I Spartacus. <laughs> My wife also lives with David Beckham and George Clooney and several other stars. And she loves it because she can get friends around. She goes, oh, who's your, who's your husband? Oh, David Beckham. She gets the card out to prove it. And we get, I get this great poster and it comes through and it says, to David Beckham. I go, oh, great, I'm David Beckham. And I get out the little slips and I go down to Tesco's and I scan the cards and I get my discount. I love it. Do I know who I am? No. Does it make any difference to me? No. Do I get the value? Yes. Is the analysis working? Yes, we love it. So why are you so hung up about it? Do you need to be who you think you are or not? So here's the rub, OK? The rub is here. All of the cost of validating identity that the banks go through for transactions, for giving you a credit card, for getting an account, for doing something, for coming to a site and telling you who you are, OK, there's lots of cost involved in saying the physical me or the claims and history about where you de de your degree or history or your jobs or something. It's cost, cost, cost. Where's all the value? Ooh, it's on the other side. So all the cost is on one side. A bunch of Muppets who go and do this. OK, all the value's over there. OK, where's Amazon compete? Mm, there. Where's Google compete? Mm, over there. Where's Apple competing? Mm, over there. Where's everybody who's creating value and economic wealth competing? Mm, over there. Don't compete here. Identity, value, cost. Very important when we talk about data. Google does not want your identity. It wants the data that creates something about you. It doesn't need to know your name, and your name is not identity. Because what I was going back to is that graph I showed you earlier about the spikes, the pulses, the waves, and the signals. Because those are the things from your data and the social data and the way you interact with people that I want to get hold of. Because I want to get something for that job description, the analysis of the person. I want to know who you influence or who influences you. Where are you in the social chain of doing something? What authority do you have and who is it granted from? And I'm not talking page rank and looking at the academic. I'm talking amongst your friends. I'm talking about how relevant what you're thinking and your thinking is based on the topic that you're applying for. Are you up to date? What is the relevancy? What's your preferences? What's your credibility, your trust, your reach? Reputation. 
I'm starting to determine reputation based on the way you react with your friend's data, the way your friends react to your data, what you're doing with your own data. It's a bit of a mess, but without you, I can't do any of this. If you exclude yourself from this, where are you going to be in 20 years? Maybe you don't have a choice. That AI land's still available, I'm selling it. It's really good. Quick one for you as a person. Are your friends important? We carry on sort of friending the odd person in Facebook. Have we ever thought, actually, why not friend people who have more influence than me? Because that gets my influence level up. Why not befriend, actually, more people than I know? Because that might improve my reputation. Why don't I start doing more tweets, more blogs, more this? Because it might increase my propensity to influence other people to go and do something. Because if I was a marketeer, wouldn't it be great if you could influence lots of people to buy a product? So I had a bit of a problem the other day with Enron. Not Enron, Enpower. Wrong company. <laughs> it's late in the day. Uh, Enpower. I had a bit of problems uh, with, the old, uh, with the old power and utilities and not quite getting what I want. And this very nice chap called Martin came on as the manager. And Martin told me his surname. So there was me. Oh, he's on Facebook. Friend him. Bing! And he stupidly friended me. And now I really pester him all the time because he still hasn't responded fast enough. But I can see through all of his history. It's wonderful. It's great for me. Horrible for him. So you have a spectrum of friends. Are you starting to work out who your friends are and what you can use them for? And actually, how your friends are using you? It's a really interesting series of questions, what a friend is and what I can tell from the types of friends that you have. Same with Twitter. We have loads of profiles coming along about what types of people are in there and what you look like and how you're starting to behave and react and who are following you and who you follow. Tells me huge amounts. Now, here's the rub again. Shades of abuse. I know what's totally acceptable. Acceptability traits, open, transparent, known, trusted, value, and engaging. If I do those things for you based on all the analysis of all your data, you will love me because I'll give you lots of value and lots of engagement and lots of nice context and preferences and ooh, just all it ooh, and it'd be fantastic. Okay? On the other side, unacceptable traits. Closed, secret, unknown, untrusted, value destroying, fraudulent, and theft. And we can't like know that end. We don't like it. And if I was doing those things, you'd get me shut down pretty quickly. <coughs> Here's the problem. Creepy. <laughs> if I took you now down to a movie, a nice creepy movie, and we all sat in the audience, and at the end of it I asked who found it creepy, some of you put your hands up, some of you won't. And that tells you the problem we have here. People find different things creepy. Again, back to experiences, back to models, back on experience, back on what they want to do. So the person sitting in front of you might love having all of their data sucked and something really interesting with it. You might not. So what somebody finds creepy and fun somebody finds abusive, you might not. Here's an example. I want a piece of data from you. I want your exact location. And I'm going to present this exact location back to you in two ways. The first way is the Weasley clock. And the Weasley clock says the sentiment of actually your location. They're at school. They're OK. They're in mortal danger. OK, I don't know. It hasn't presented the exact location, but it's given me enough to know what's being presented. The, the uh, Morada's map told me exactly where everybody was, who you were with, which way you were walking, who's around you, which direction you've come from and it tracks you. Why is that so important? Same piece of data. The difference is presentation. So the issue is not about how you grab data. It's the way, the way you present data back. Don't worry about getting lots of data. Just don't abuse people by giving them the wrong type of data in the wrong interface, in the wrong place. Privacy. Privacy is a bit of a problem because we get really hung up about it. The reason we get hung up about it is we have a privacy or private versus public debate. Aristotle thankfully gave us a slightly different model. He looked at this and he said there are these things called virtues 
and a virtue is courage. And if you take a courage to excess, it becomes recklessness. If you take courage as a virtue to a deficiency, it becomes cowardness. And what it started to demonstrate is there's not one or the other, there's actually an in-between. So no black and white. Actually, let's convert white between two extremes of black. Let's put black between two extremes of white. So when you look at privacy and privacy and what's going to happen, let's draw one model. And you could draw this the other way around and put public in the middle and, and private on the outside. I've drawn it this way. We've got one model of public which we, we as a generation kind of like understand because it's the broadcast world. I'm going to set you a challenge now. Go and buy yesterday's newspaper. It's completely public, but flipping hard. So why are we taking that rule of public and applying it to the internet, which is also public? So we have a set of rules built for a series of medias which are not applying to where we are today. So actually there is not one extreme of public where you can deal with all of the publicness in one debate. You've actually got to separate things up. Now we could swap the model and do it the other way around and decide actually what are the extremes of private. And you can have private, which could be shared on SMS, because it is actually friend to friend. Okay, versus private, which is actually up there. Because actually once it's dropped off the screen, it's gone. But it was only shared to a person. It might not necessarily be public. We are actually not sure what those two words mean. But it's great over a glass of red wine. We know within the public-private debate that there's two sides of the motorway which we will fall off, which hits the unethical, immoral, illegal and creepy. Okay, where the kids are running down is this side of the motorway, which is towards freedom. And discovering actually by being open and transparent, you can really be engaging. Unfortunately, we're of a generation of old farts who love control, and we're heading down this way. And there is this sort of crossing, which we're not quite sure which side of the green verge that everybody's running along but it is becoming a bit of a problem for us. So at this point I go, data is a commodity. Its ownership is unimportant. Value is retained by those who own the feedback loop, who get deep and dirty in the transformation of data to create value, and marry complexity and uncertainty. In the New Kingdom, loyalty is dead, privacy is a setting, trust is the challenger, the princes are brands, princesses are simplicity, attention is queen, and data is king. What the hell is relevant to what you guys do? From my perspective, I've got this, which is my granddad had one profession. Our parents probably had three jobs. We're likely to have ten jobs. Our kids are going to have several jobs at the same time. And our gra gra grandchildren will probably have several professions. We're going through change. And it's changing very fast and it's changing an awful lot of people's perspective on employment and jobs. We Again, I'm talking as me, as a person, you as a person, not as a professional. We're not the same anymore. And actually the generation who are coming up, the screen agers, they're, you know, I employ some of these screen agers in jobs and what I love about them is they rock up one day and we've employed them and they, about a week later they leave and go, why are you leaving? Don't like it. you not got another job? No, I'm off, I'll find the right thing. We would have never done that. We would have stayed in a job till we find another job. They don't have these perspectives. They have a completely different view of the world. They manage lots of profiles. They don't have one Facebook profile. They have 15. They don't have one Twitter account. They have 10. They do have two mobile phones. They don't. Actually, they have four. I don't know where the two spare arms are, but bloody hell. And the one thing is, they're quicker than us. They are so much quicker than us. And one of the books I showed at the beginning was uh, Nicholas Carr's book, The Shallows. And he argues specifically about we've been brought up in a generation of reading books. Sit there quietly for 15 hours, concentrate your kid, and if you're not, I'm going to slap you around the head. You need to learn to concentrate. What we've discovered is that actually kids who can take lots of devices and work across lots and lots of media, they're not more stupid. What they have is an intellect which is far greater because they can assimilate data and data and data and data and come up with understanding and insight and knowledge. They're able to pull lots of facts much faster than any of us. Their reaction speeds are quicker. And do you know what? They can't concentrate on a bloody thing. So what? So 
Research goes both ways. These kids, before they turn up in front of you, they've done all the research into the brand. They know what the style is. They know the standards that you've set or the company is setting to how they're going to behave. And if you don't meet up to those standards, they will blog, they will tweet, they will tell their friends. That company will become completely unemployable. They will know that before they turn up. They know the management. In fact, they've probably researched you on your Facebook profile and on your Twitter and seen who your friends are and seen who's been placed. And actually, if you've ever linked to somebody who's been placed, they're phoning them up to say, how did that person interview? What are they like? Did they give you the job? Did they not give you the job? How do I negotiate with this person? They ain't bothered. They just do it. They've done the research on the market. They are brilliant. They are so much further ahead. We might as well just give up. And you're not interested in that one. Not where, but what. They don't go to where you're blogging and you're tweeting. Actually, they're not desperately interested. They've got tools which drag the whole lot together to produce sentiment. They want to know the style. <clears throat> one of the most fascinating facts is kids can now have a conversation with one character in SMS, and they can understand the sentiment of the one character. And they can flick it backwards and forwards. And they can have a whole conversation based on one character. And we go, oh, that's impossible. They do it. They're there. They've moved. They, they are digital. Unfortunately, they don't want our paper version of a digital world. They've actually done digital. They skipped paper. Data can give you best practice, above the line and below the line. Above the line. I can tell you where to post a job. I can tell you the return on investment of any placement, where it is. And I can tell you the best time to post a job. And that's not, oh, it's 5.30 on a Friday and it's this type of job. I can tell you because the news and the sentiment about a particular company or industry or fact that's happening on Twitter, which means actually if you post it now, it's going to go viral. So yesterday, while we were having one of the sessions, the FT sent out a tweet saying we need to, a new digital community manager. I retweeted it uh, and it went viral. Within 20 minutes, they had replaced the job. It's just staggering. Sorry, I really should have changed this blue down the bottom. What the data can give you, best practice. I can tell you the person's reputation who's sitting in front of you, and I can tell your reputation. I can see how much connections you have. I can see your authority. I know you as a person, because actually I can find all the connections and nodes and what you do. I can find what you recommend, what you read, what you see. And by the way, you're not actually often you know, going on and tapping this data in. It's just because you've got that little mobile device in your pocket. That's all I need. Don't need a lot else. I can tell which shops you go to because that mobile's in your pocket. You don't need to tell me anything. Now that might worry you, or you might go, this is really engaging. I can vali validate identity on who you are based on behavior. Takeaways, nobody knows everything. Data in every aspect is two way. Are you the influencer or have you been influenced? Trust, privacy and brand are three bits which are going to get negotiated and debated going forward. You must control the feedback loops. Disruption, things I've just done, free. Analysis is complex and expensive. Implementation needs partners. You cannot do this on your own. And people have got to go and find working partners who can work together to deliver it. And that's what I've got to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>